the cord before you do the socks. Okay, so for those of you that follow the sock journey, let's see the socks. The sock journey. Okay, so these ones, see, I don't know. Well, I'll just show them to you guys. So these ones have little like game controllers on them. Right? Oh, uh, yeah. Game video game controllers. And like, I'll kind of tell you a funny story because my other socks are rather boring because I have one on a different foot, another one. And my story is that my two so my socks do not match today um, because I had set these aside to wear them. And um, my oldest son has uh, Tourette's OCD and he cannot wear, like it's the only way it, like it really manifests itself is in his socks. He can't wear two of the same socks. And so he'll, he'll come into my sock drawer because I have a lot of varied socks, obviously, and he will grab them and like separate them out. I'm like, there are so many like single pairs of socks in there right now, like grab two of those. No, he grabs the one I had set aside. I didn't set it aside in a way that he would have known, uh, but I had kind of tucked them over to the side. I was like, I'm gonna wear those this Friday. And uh, he wore one of them this week. And so I was like, son, what are you doing? And he's, he's laughing. I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to do two different socks today. It's interesting that with his OCD, that having different socks instead of having to have them be the same, that that's interesting to me. So, well, yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. And like, if he puts two on that are too similar, he'll, his, his Tourette's will just start like screaming, oh, wow. making all sorts of yeah. noise. We have a lot of fun in our house. Um, I, I could see that. I, I have to show you. I don't know if I can get my foot up. I'm gonna oh, I want to see it. I want to see it. I, 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 I they're, oh, shoot. Let me see. Uh, flamingos. flamingos. Yeah. I saw, there, there, there they are. Yeah, there. Yeah. Nice. I am not limber. And, but yeah, I said to Scott, I said, oh, I have got some fun socks. He said, I have, a, so I have a pair thing. of flamingo socks myself, but yours have like some really cool flora on them. Yes, they do. And yeah, then I've got Christmas socks and that's kind of about it because otherwise I wear socks to run in. So yeah, anyway, yeah. so enough sock talk. Thank you all for joining us for the pro dependence webinar this afternoon. So this month, Debbie and um, Matt are switching and Scott was going to switch too, but then he was needed for another something. So I said, I'm, I'm here. So, so, um, so here then, I am. So and then I just sent a message to Scott that I just found out I have a meeting on like the 17th, which is another one of the ones I was going to take over for Debbie. And so I have to skip that one that day. I was super Well, then bummed, maybe but... Scott and I will be together. We'll see. We hey, there, see you, so. there you we go. We have flexibility on it's flexible Friday. Hey, you so. guys could do. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a couple's one on that day that'd be we, fun we we actually did because dr david's been out the last two wednesdays so scott and i have filled in you know uh together we do that occasionally when there's something but but knowing that i actually had one person in mind that would be a one-off so i'm gonna write myself a note so pardon me a second while i do that yeah. but let's get started um um so July, june 17th nomad okay got it yeah, okay Scott, i had emailed scott and he told me so i know but i'm he, gonna i i had somebody in mind i have to go find my note about who it was and oh, cool. uh, so there may be a special guest on this on the seven feet so we'll see wait mm -hmm. um so i'll jump in a little bit and i keep coming back to this and i think it's because i it, it how important it is in making connection and I and one of the things that I love about the pro dependency model when I first uh, heard Rob introduce it was really this concept that anybody who's been on here has heard me talk about over and over, which is gracious assumptions. Um, and because when to be honest, when Rob started talking about pro dependence, and I remember being in like the first group that he kind of said, Hey, I want to teach this to, to you guys. And so I jumped in on that first group mm -hmm. and, and heard it like right before his book came out or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And um, he basically took like applied so many principles of emotionally focused couples therapy to uh, the concepts of recovery health and being a partner that's in recovery with uh, somebody who's struggling with addiction and and really using that gracious assumption that gracious assumption is 
you're not sick because you love somebody so much that you might be might even be living unhealthy to try and help this person that you love you're not sick because you so what we because you're trying to help them so what we try to do is think okay what's the gracious assumption here right like i have parents who will come to me and they'll say how do i know when to kick our drug addicted son out of the house mm -hmm. and here's the hardest thing about it i tell them you'll know it's right when as sad as you're going to be as devastated as you're going to be that you know you could take the phone call that the police say we found your son or your daughter uh dead in a ditch somewhere right that and and they say well that's horrible what if i'm never okay with that then i say well then don't kick him out of the house right and so even if kicking them out of the house might be what they need in order to find recovery. It might also be what kills them. Like not you kicking them out of the house, but the choices they end up making after that leaves them overdosed somewhere or whatever. But the, but the reality of it is when somebody is active in their addiction, they're making horrible choices and they, they can treat other family members terribly. They treat themselves terribly. And, but the gracious assumption as a partner or as a parent of a child who's or, or a family member, the gracious assumption is I'm doing what I know how to do in order to love them. And so don't tell me I'm sick because I'm trying to love this family member as much as I am. And that's where Rob and many of us didn't like the codependency model. So so, but when I pull it back and we just go to couples, I keep coming back to, we make as many gracious assumptions as we can in our relationship for our partner until we get to a place where we say, you know what, I've done everything I know how to do. I'm done hurting as much as I'm hurting. I'm at peace letting go of the relationship. I'm done, right? I used to years ago have this idea in my head that, you know, uh, you can save every marriage. And I don't actually believe that anymore. Um, uh, and gratefully so, right? It wouldn't, I wouldn't be a very healthy clinician if I felt that way. But because I love couples and relationships, <laughs> that desire in me to save or help every marriage wasn't negative. It just wasn't realistic. So if we have gracious assumptions it, it, uh, for our partner, and really gracious assumptions for ourselves. Look, I'm doing this because I love them. Even if I'm not doing it right, way more compassion in the relationship, way more opportunity to connect with our partner and try to find healthy ways to set good boundaries in the relationship. Um, and so, yeah, I, I thought I'd talk a little bit about gracious assumptions. Any questions or comments, Tammy? Well, I, yeah, it's interesting because Mary Franz was, talking about giving benefit of the doubt, like, and she, I mean, it was within context, I mean, she's got the trust solution, you know, talking about uh, couples, you know, so, so it's kind of a theme, this, uh, you know, of reframing, you know, it isn't, you're doing this wrong, you know, I have seen so many partners, um, you know, in that struggle, like, you know, and, and, and just for sake of argument, he's the addict, she's the partner, just that's easy pronouns while we're talking, but you know, he's not really doing the work. He's not really shifting and they're trying and trying and trying. And at some point, like I can almost see in their head, they know for their safety, they're going to have to separate because he's not changing. But at, at some point it comes to their heart. And I think that that's, you know, when you can align those two, you know, then it's the right thing for you. But you know, I, I was talking to somebody earlier today and, and it's you know, like either he comes to treatment or she leaves. And I said, I don't know what, I don't know what's right for you. You know, if, if you need to leave the relationship, that's what's right for you. Right. None of us can pick, you know, and, and I think what you're saying, to, like, I think we can help all couples. It's just, can we help them stay together or can we help them come to terms with what they need for their own safety? I, you know, I think that's more what it is you know yeah absolutely and i think that even that idea if he comes to treatment or i leave him well if you're at peace with that and if he chooses not to come to treatment you move forward with it not mm -hmm. as a threat not as an ultimatum no. it, right. it literally look that's where i'm at 
well then be able to say that and then do it but it, you need to be at yeah. peace not in panic and and the mistake i see people make is they're panicking saying well you got to go to treatment or i'm divorcing you hoping that they pick treatment yeah yeah and it's no. like okay but if they don't you, you've put yourself in a bad spot don't say it if yeah. you aren't at peace with it and the other thing about it when i heard you say that treatment or divorce well what if they go to treatment and after two three four weeks of treatment they come back and you're like i don't like this still Right. And, and and there's that, but th this was like, do I take the money and just leave or do I right. help? Yeah. Yeah. So th yeah, this was, because... yeah. And, and I was like, and I don't know what is right for you. I mean, oh, both totally. of those really are options, you know, you and if you want to, you sink a lot of money into, you know, the, into treatment and, and essentially that's money you're taking away from the divorce, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. I can totally, and, and, that dilemma is tough. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and I can't make it, you know, I mean, I, I I'm not living that situation. Oh, no, totally. Nobody else is. So it's always up to the partner, you know, to when, if it's right for you to leave, it's for you to leave. If it's not, you know, like whatever you need to do to have the support so that you are safe within, within the context of the chaos, you know, that is, is being created. So in the group and and the gracious assumption there, because people will come to me, well, what should I do? And and the yeah. gracious assumption there is they're just scared. They don't want to make the I know. Choice. I get it. Yeah. And they're yeah. just hoping somebody will guide them. And the hardest yeah. thing is, is I'm like, I wish I could tell you. I don't know what the yeah. right move is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and we can look yeah. back and go, well, it looks like you should have taken the money and run. Unfortunately, in this case, you didn't. Or, wow, I'm so glad you didn't take the money and run because this has worked out, you know? Yeah. But, but I think even, you know, even if like, like, even if it isn't successful and I'm always hopeful and, you right. know, obviously with it, it, our expert clinical team, they stand up very, you know, they're going to have the tools to be successful. What they choose to do with it ultimately is their decision. But, you know, for, for some it is, okay, now I've done everything I can, you know, I did it, it. There isn't the what if, what if I had just tried, you know, or what if we had tried treatment? Now you have, now you have, you know, the uh, a clear uh, picture, yeah, you know, absolutely. so I think that that's a beneficial on, I mean, an expensive lesson to learn. Sure. Oh, but totally. still, you know, you, you don't know, you, you don't know. And maybe this is, a, maybe this is a terrible example, but like, I actually love like how you like walked through that and recognize the mental state, like, because a very similar thing, very different, but similar happened when we had our puppy who was probably about a year old, maybe 18 months old. And honestly, I have a lot of socks in my sock collection that are singles because she likes to chew up the other ones. And if my son leaves one out, then she eats it, you know? And she had eaten something because that's what Ooh. puppies do. Yeah. And yeah. it got stuck. Yeah. And I remember sitting in the pet emergency room with my wife and they came out with, hey, we think we could do the surgery and it'll be successful. But whether it's successful or not, here's how much it is. And I'm sitting there going, that is so expensive. Like, like that's a car, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and I'm going, mm -hmm. oh my gosh. And I remember that feeling that I had mm -hmm. of, what do I like? I, what am I going to tell my kids? Hey, it was too expensive. So dog's dead right now. Some mm -hmm. people would be like, yes, it's an animal. And mm -hmm. that's unfortunately mm -hmm. how it goes. Like, fortunately at the time I had the money that I could do it, but I had that thought in my mind of if I don't, there's that, what if, right. And, mm -hmm. and I had to make the decision with my wife, what the best choice was now. I definitely went home and said, kids, if this happens again, we can't do it, right? Like, mm -hmm. we have to make keep sure- Keep your socks cleaned up. Keep your <laughs> socks cleaned up. Like, and I didn't shame my kids, like, it's your fault, no. you mm -hmm. know, but because it actually wasn't even a sock, it was something else. Mm -hmm. But but the, but the thing about it was, it's that it sometimes the money is totally worth it because we can go- okay, you know what? I did everything I knew how to do. And, and mm -hmm. in order to walk away from the marriage in peace, um, I can say I did everything I knew. 
I put all the money and effort I could. Now I'm done. Like my hands are clean. And so that what if that money can be worth every bit of personal peace that a person could have. Yeah. Yeah. I, a couple, I like math, but a couple of years ago, I thought, I wonder what my, um, uh, my recovery has cost. And, and like, I don't know the exact dollar figures because oh, I was totally. treatment a long time ago. Yeah. But, um, am, am I's parents gratefully, you know, help support, you know, that the cause, um, uh, <laughs> cause anyway, but you know, and then like, you know, therapy and all this. So I kind of came up with a, a rounded number and then I divided it by the number of days I was in recovery at the time. Right. And, you know, like really good value, really, really, really good value. But, you know, and, but, but on the flip side of it, no price tag was, I mean, there's no price tag for the the gift of recovery that, you know, I've been able to experience. So, so, right. and both are true, but, but everybody has to pick. So, yeah. Okay. I encourage everyone. Okay. So we've already got a question in the Q and a, but please jump in and add some more questions. Cause yeah. I, you know, it's always better yeah. that way. Yes. Okay, so the question is, I have been sober since December of 2020, that's awesome, from porn and lies that go with its use, and my wife goes back and forth on divorcing me or not. I have lived in and out of the house during this period of time. So let's see, so that's a a year and a half-ish, so we're about 18 months. Okay, all right. I have lived in and out of the house during this period of time. She is at the point where she is asking for divorce again. She has said that she stayed with me over the last six months because she told herself it wasn't um, I wasn't that person or those things did not happen. I have owned the last year and I have that I indeed was the person who did those horrible and abusive things. I fear that my validation has amplified her fears. Now she needs to push me away. And only way she knows how to do this is through a divorce. Can you help me understand the attachment bid with my wife so I can better show up for her? Um, and then this person adds, thank you for the webinars, Matt, as I have listened to your past webinars, which helped me become the man that my wife was willing to have the courage to step back into the relationship for the past six years. So the nice validation. Yeah, so. that's awesome. Um, so this one, so let me jump in on, you, you ask about what her attachment bid is. And it's tough because I'm not entirely sure of her behavior. Um Based on what you're telling me, I'm going to try and come up with what it feels like the attachment bid is. And for those of you who maybe are listening for the first time, um, the attachment bid is anytime we have a behavior, we're typically looking for connection of some sort, even if it's an unhealthy behavior. We're often looking for, uh, almost always looking to soothe our attachment wounds and to feel more secure in a relationship. So even if I uh, go drink, you know, a bottle of vodka, you might go, what's the attachment bid? Well, my attachment bid is to have comfort and soothing, uh, maybe nurture, if you will. I'm just not choosing an outlet that would actually work. And so the idea here is, is if she's asking for divorce, she's actually looking for closeness. And I, in this situation, um, if she's in an attachment bid, right, is what I'm saying, she's actually looking for closeness. I'm wondering that every time she brings up the essentially the pain, if when you're validating her, yep, th- that's the man I was, those are all the things I've done, what you're doing is, though that's healthy to take ownership, if her need is actually for you to lean into her, um, lean into her fear or her discomfort, right? So let's say she's like, I need a divorce. And, and, you know, I don't think I can do this. I wouldn't take, I wouldn't take ownership in that moment. Well, yep, let's talk about what a terrible person I was, right? What I would do is say, okay, so talk to me about why you're scared. Because when you um, threaten divorce, if I'm understanding it, you're trying to tell me how much you're hurting right now. You're trying to tell me how much pain you're in right now. And so rather than me talking about how horrible of a person I was, rather than me talking about maybe even how good of a person I've been lately, not the right move either. Let me know, help me understand what is hurting you right now. 
what's the discomfort that's coming up for you and let's explore all the different ways that pain is happening because obviously you're hurting so much that you're threatening to end the relationship i want to understand your pain i want to see your pain so i'm going to try and go there don't talk about me talk about her distress because if you were earlier in recovery, I might say, hey, validate the pain. But if you're finding over time that validating her pain by talking and taking ownership isn't working, that's probably not her attachment wound that she's trying to get soothed, or you've already soothed that attachment wound. Now she wants to see, can you have, can you be in her current present day hope? Her, her, her present day hurt, present day pain, and, and move to a place of hope. So I would focus more on being present in today's pain than I would trying to validate why that pain was has always been there. So as I walk through kind of your statement and your question, that would probably be the attachment bid that I would say is coming up based on what you're sharing. So add more into the comment section or the questions uh if there's more data that might help but hopefully that helps tammy what comes up as you hear me say no that? i i really liked it but what i'm, I'm i want to reflect back because what i hear you saying is you're like he may benefit from asking her about her current pain rather than either validating yes i was that or look i'm look, look at all the recovery work i've done Fo turn the focus back to what's going on for you right now that this is coming up for you right. that you want to move you know move from where we've been working together to either divorce, to divorce. out of the house mm -hmm. yeah yes yeah, yeah. just okay. so i'm okay. clear it's because if you it, it's really common and there's a place where i mean i cannot stress the need for accountability enough accountability is super important because it's you're not blaming you're taking ownership the problem is if accountability isn't working, you continue to take accountability and it isn't working. And that's what it sounds like is happening here. That shifts my brain to, she's probably not asking for accountability at this point. If you're really good on being accountable and this pain and wound is still coming up for her, she's probably trying to tell you, I'm in pain right now. Stop, not that she's saying this, stop talking about who you were so you might be right at this point you keep validating maybe her pain but i would spend more time to figure out yes i was that guy i don't feel like i'm that guy now so why are you still hurting and how can i teach me teach me how can i understand what's happening i wouldn't phrase it the way i just phrased it go back to rewind and go back to what i said earlier where it's more hey, help me understand what uh, keeps happening, that your pain keeps getting triggered because I don't want you to feel that pain. The truth is I may continue to do it as I learn how to show up for you better, but teach me why you keep hurting and what I can do. I struggle with that because it's not just what you can do, a lot of with a betrayed partner, she also has to take accountability for her pain and learn to work through it and find healing. Now, that may feel really painful for me to say, because if you're somebody struggling with an addiction, you don't want to throw that at her. Well, you've got to take responsibility for your pain. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. <laughs> right? Don't say that. I, I'm, I agree. Don't say that. <laughs> it, although that concept it has truth to it, we all need to take ownership of our pain. And what I mean by that is we need to take ownership of, of finding healing for our pain, right? I can look back at my past. I can blame my parents, my, you know, spiritual leaders, school teachers, school bullies, right? I can look back at all of that and if you will blame them for all of my pain, but I have to take accountability for how I'm going to heal it now, right? And so so anyway, th those are just some of my quick thoughts as you ask her attachment bid, uh, how you can show up in her pain and let her be present. And maybe if you're jumping back to the past, you're just not helping her stay present in the pain. 
Yeah, I, no, I love that idea. No, I, I think, you know, cause clearly what's been happening isn't helping. So, you know, this, that sounds like a different approach that, you know, could, could come to the spot where she's at, you know? Um, so, and, and, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I love it when partners are reaching out for support, you know, and for them, it's, it, and it's not because, you know, they're, broken, you know, uh, as a codependent or whatever, it's because the addict's addiction has hurt them and they deserve support to help them be on a healing path to know that they're not alone. So it's from a very different standpoint. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very encouraging of partners getting support. Addicts getting, you know, accountability oh. work, you know, they, they, they need a very different approach you know, it isn't, uh, you know, it isn't the same thing for both of you, oh, but, totally. but yes, ultimately it's healing, but how they get there, you know, is different. So, okay. Next question. Is it better to be robotic or monotone or to be an emotional roller coaster with my wife? <laughs> and I'm laughing at this because it's like, oh, this is such a good question. I know, but this is like such an addict, like, uh, like, it's like <laughs> here or here, there's no in between. And I so get it. Like, I'm always, you know, the only time I was swinging, you know, in the middle was when I was swinging through to the other extreme. So I 100% get this. I appreciate your question. And I'm going to start over. Is it better to be robotic or monotone or to be an emotional roller coaster with my wife? She is desperate for closeness and insists I am not connected or making any attempts, bids for connection. My disconnection seems to cause more problems than trying to be consistent and even keeled. My childhood had had a lot of volatility. And as a result, I attempt to keep everything under wraps and not lose control. I so understand that. I never talk about divorce, but we are at the point where she feels like there is no end to her nightmare. I am, I'm oh. so sorry, but yeah, thank, you, you are... thank you for being here. I was not making fun, please. Oh no. I, I, mean, I, I just I'm... was like, yep, I completely get it. So yeah, yeah, no, hopefully you guys hear our compassion. We aren't, uh, we're definitely not making fun, but it's at the same time, there is a certain element that is comical in recovery too, right? We need to we need to recognize the the way our brains pattern brain patterns get into and everything else. I actually really love this question, but I also hear a lot of pain too. All of these questions, mm -hmm. every question has pain. Okay, so I'm going to start, and I'm just going to start with the first part. Is it better to be robotic or monotone or be an emotional roller coaster with my wife? If, if you were to hold me to say, I have one or the other, right? Which if I'm hearing you, robotic and monotone is your, um, your MO, your modus operandi, operandi, I think is how you say that, right? And that's your MO. That's the mode of operations that you've always used. Uh, then in your case, I would say it's going to be better to be an emotional roller coaster. So, but the answer actually is two two there's really two questions you're asking here and that is what's better for my wife what's better for me right because i've had relationships where i've been working with people and it is absolutely the best thing for that relationship for the partner to be robotic and monotone because emotional roller coaster in their situation was rage and maybe even emotional abuse or physical abuse, right? And so I would say in that situation, it's way better to be robotic and monotone as you practice the skills. Um, and so the, the truth is, I'm gonna answer this totally for the person who asked the question only, uh, but hopefully you guys understand the bigger concept that I'm trying to teach. So in your case, it sounds like being an emotional roller coaster would be better. Here's why. Uh, because you've done robotic and monotone, you grew up in a child uh, childhood with a lot of volatility. So you need to learn emotional tolerance for your own emotions. Um, you have a lot of fear around your own emotions and being uh, the opposite of volatile or no being volatile, right? You mm -hmm. have fear around being volatile and maybe being like, your, your mother or your father or your siblings growing up or whoever was volatile that created so much disruption. And so what I would do is go to her and tell her, uh, I'm saying her and I, oh, you said wife. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> I always get like, my head goes, wait, I don't know. Yeah, so then, yeah. so, so ultimately I would go to her and tell her I'm scared to death of actually being an emotional roller coaster. I think 
you know, based on this webinar with Matt, sounds like what you need is for me to show you more emotional volatility and I'm terrified. And so I can try uh, and I'm going to try and I'm hoping it helps you. But in my mind, I can't understand why anybody would want emotional volatility, emotional roller coaster. Now, if you're anything like a lot of the people I've worked with, what you consider to be emotional roller coaster, you're probably still pretty, pretty mild. Um, because a lot of people who have been monotone and robotic their whole lives and emotionally shut down, you know, having a couple of tears fall in the middle of a movie is, a, is an emotional roller coaster, right? And it's like, it's like, hey, uh, give yourself a little grace here. You probably need more work at opening up, being vulnerable, sharing your emotion, being a mess. She probably <laughs> wants to see that you're a mess because she wants to know, do you know how to be vulnerable? Do you even want to be vulnerable? And so in your, and in your situation, I would argue in therapy, you probably need to be a mess more often. You probably need to emotionally let it out, cry and feel healthy anger and feel fear and feel sadness and feel joy. You're probably holding everything in that you hardly feel joy. Sometimes I've seen addicts go to their addiction so that they can feel joy, which isn't even real joy, but it's the only thing they felt like could give them a, a sense of joy, which is sad. So honestly, in your situation, I don't know that I would say this for everybody, swinging a little bit more to the other side to being emotional roller coaster is, is probably what I would advise. Now, ultimately, Tammy's right you're probably going to swing a little bit off to this side and then swing back and swing. And we want to get you to a place where you find a centeredness where you aren't unhealthily, emotionally volatile, but you aren't robotic and monotone, but finding that new space is difficult and really awesome. Once you get there. Well, and I was thinking, I wonder because volatility Emotional volatility has such a negative connotation to it. Totally I'm does. wondering if, and it were, so like I could be a coaster junkie. I'm just like, I had planned to retire at some point and then just go around to, so roller coasters I actually like, you know, but that is not everybody. And so, but I wonder if there's a different um, visual or analogy that you can come up with, you know, ha having more emotional bandwidth, you right. know, I mean, is there some, some term that because what I really suspect is emotional transparency. You know, right. if you're all buttoned up um, um, and it feels like if, you know, if you cry in the movie, it's like, oh my gosh, I completely lost it. You know, like, is there, is there something where you can, can phrase it different that you right. can, can go, yeah, that would be a term that I could live with and isn't quite as scary. Mm -hmm. I love what Matt said about having the honest conversation with your wife, I kept thinking, I bet she's just looking for you to not be the same buttoned up person well, because that's scary for her too. Yes. And I actually love that. You're like, well, I'm a person who likes roller coasters. And my challenge to you is this, Tammy, if I told you, you could only ride one roller coaster the rest of your life. How much do you like that roller coaster? Um, it, you know, I, I would get, I would get bored with it. I, I was like, could we at least pick one amusement park so I can be? No, nope. <laughs> so, yeah. no, this is why I say it because, oh. because when we start talking about an emotional roller coaster, the reality of it is, is that this individual most likely is when, when I find somebody who has a roller coaster or I find a relationship that goes through the same roller coaster, we get tired of it. And, and, if they, and to be honest, him being robotic, I'm assuming it's a him here, being robotic and monotone, him being robotic and monotone is a roller coaster for her. And she's tired yeah. of it. Yeah. She wants, she's like probably going, give me any other roller coaster. Give me the other end of the spectrum. I will, mm -hmm. I crave it. I'll take that over nothing. Mm -hmm. What she really mm -hmm. wants is you to be able to have swings as needed where you can be a little bit more emotional or a lot more emotional at times mm -hmm. you can be mm -hmm. more steady and stable 
if you will, emotionally than other times, because she wants at times for her to be able to be a mess and for you to be steady and stable while she's a mess. The problem is when you're robotic and monotone, you probably didn't know how to show up for her in her emotional mess. And so what she's really looking for is variance, most likely, that she would take you being a disaster because it's at least gives her an idea that something can change in the relationship. And, and though she's not going to want that long term, um, it's far better than her having hopelessness that this nightmare of you being disconnected is going to continue on forever. So, yeah, well, and emotions like in addiction, we shut down all our emotions. We shut down the negative emotions, but we also shut down the positive emotions. And so like how, I mean, like, I bet she would just, it would knock her socks off to use another socks analogy. You know, if you were exuberant with joy about something like, like let yourself right. experience positive, you know, like the, the good feeling emotions in a more expansive way. And then be okay with, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing this negative and we survive, you know, I didn't think I could at first because they were so intense and, it, you know, any emotion was just too much because I was so shut down. Clearly I got over that. Um, so it's one of those where, <laughs> um, you know, but, 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 you know, yes, I have pain, you know, that, you know, and it hurts and things like that, but I also experienced great joy and I wouldn't trade any of that so so i would invite you to look at this as an opportunity for you to experience what you were i mean you you didn't get to um as a kid you had to be shut down right. because there was so much volatility out there it wasn't safe for you so so dip your toes in and, and just give it a try so. oh it's super vulnerable and for you to offer that to your wife like to basically say like hey I've never learned how to do this. And do you mm -hmm. really want to go here with me? I mean, she'll probably be feel like that's an honor. Yes, I will go to your childhood and, and where you learn to work through the difficulty and the pains that you had and learn how to feel and share emotion. She's probably going to be ecstatic, but it, I mean, it'll be messy for both of you. There's going to be ups and downs and points where she's feeling overwhelmed. And, and that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. I love it. And, and, yeah, and, and just it's it's okay. It's it's it is okay. We do survive like more expansive emotions. So, okay, so the person from the first question added, "This is helpful." She still states that she doesn't trust me. It's only been a year and a half, and I get that. So she indicates to me that she doesn't want to be with someone who is abusive towards her, and she wants to heal, and she cannot heal while staying married to her abuse. The, the, I'm an, I'm gonna. Um, I struggle with this. There's a whole bunch of content out there that are labeling people as abusers and the, 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 the behavior, yeah. you know, is hurtful. And I get that, but to label it as an abuser, it doesn't leave room, you know, for, for healing of, of the relationship at the, the, yeah, so I, I really I mean, struggle with that. Oh, I've always, I always struggle with labels, right? Like you'll hear me here talk about somebody who struggled with addiction, right? I try to, I try to prevent labels. I mean, I've had somebody called me out once on the, using the label of betrayed partner and it's, you know, there's some truth there. Like it's tough when we take on a label and, and the hard part is, is that I don't blame her for feeling like it was abuse. The hard part is, is that if in my act of being unhealthy, I did things that were abusive, does that mean I am therefore an abuser, right? And it's like, well, you know, the truth is, even, even if I'm labeled an abuser, I deserve an opportunity to heal. And, and that doesn't mean she has to stay with me while I heal. Right. Uh, but, the, right. but I don't want to be ref like, it's not fair to be referred to as an abuser the rest of my life. That's not going to, yeah. it, it wouldn't help me heal to label somebody else an abuser. Um, right. And, and it so, keeps you in the abuser victim mode oh, rather yeah. than in your brokenness, you did ho horrible things that were right. hurtful to, to me. Let's not, and let's to not you. minimize the behavior yeah, and the I'm pain. Not, right. 
Right, right. But, so, but it, I think that's different than somebody actively being an abuser. Right. And usually, I mean, even so, like if you take it away from sex addiction, you know, there's often there's brokenness like people, you know, I don't believe babies are born, you know, to be abusive to, you know, to other right. people. So it hurts and patterns, right. you know. Um, and, so anyway, and if and, then, and I don't know that I wouldn't suggest this individual take this to his spouse but to be honest um i'm trying to think if you know i would i would reiterate yeah i know you couldn't trust the old me and so i've i've worked really hard to try and be trustworthy now um and i imagine it's really hard to learn to trust me and so i'm not sure what it's going to take for you to be able to figure that out um, I hope that we can stay married uh, while you explore what that looks like for you. And I'm willing to let that take as long as it needs to. Um, I would hope you'd want to come to couples counseling with me. I hope you want to continue to do your individual therapy because my fear is that you'll never find the healing you need, uh, whether you're with me or not. And I don't want to yeah. see that. I don't want you yeah. to see you in the pain forever. And if it takes divorcing me in order for you to find that healing, then do it. If it, if we can figure out another way, I would love to, but ultimately I want you to find healing. Uh, and, and the reality of it is it would be hard to stay married to somebody who hasn't found that healing. That would be really painful, even though, hopefully you have a lot of patience for it because of the hurt that's been caused. Uh, but it would still, there's, there's pain there as well. So there, there's pain all around in this one. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I really truly hope she finds healing. My experience is that, you know, I mean, I, 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 I've talk, I talked to lots of people, you do too, but it's one of those where, you know, they've left, I left him and all this, and there's still all the hurt. They they still got stuck with all the hurt and the betrayal they're, and all the pain. It, 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 like just because the separate, you know, there's a separation doesn't take that away. So you still need to do the work. I have seen some people who call who consider themselves experts on healing. Uh, I, I see this more, and I have to be very careful because there's some really good ones out there. But I see this more with like life coaches. Right. I've, I've seen some therapists who get caught up in the narrative of your your spouse is an abuser. You were abused. And what I've tried to teach people is. So the, I'll give you an example. I was a victim of abuse, but I don't consider myself a victim. In fact, for a while, I considered myself a survivor of abuse because to me, that was a much healthier place to come from. I have survived abuse. The abuse doesn't define me. The abuser doesn't define me. In, in most of the cases, uh, I've, always, I've even been able to have some sort of a relationship with the person who caused the abuse. And in one case, a really good relationship with them. Um, now, I'm not saying that's necessary. But I had to even get to a point where I was no longer a survivor. I'm now a thriver. And mm -hmm. what that means for me is that I can actually look back at my life and say, I wouldn't change the abuse. I wouldn't make it go away because it's made me who I am. And I like who I am. I'm more compassionate. I'm more empathetic. Now, as somebody who hurt your spouse, never, ever say, <laughs> Hey, one day you're going to be grateful you went through this because you'll be a better person. That's not your space, right? However, because if somebody who had abused me said that to me, um, I would say probably some very unkind things to them. Like, don't you dare take the pain you caused me and try to spin it around for my benefit. I've had to figure out how to do that. And you don't own a part of that. Like, if that makes sense. However, mm -hmm. all of us, all of us have experienced pain. All of us have experienced trauma. Most people who struggle with addiction, it's because of trauma that they've had to go through themselves. And so the truth is, I've got to figure out how to become a thriver. 
uh, whether your wife does or not, you have to figure out how to become a thriver or at least a survivor, right? Mm -hmm. To where you recognize I have, I'm a survivor. I'm not defined by the trauma or abuse or divorce or hurt and pain I've gone through. And so I hope your wife's able to find that. And I think that you can be compassionate to that, that, and if you tell her, I hope you don't, I hope you find the healing. I hope it doesn't require us going through a divorce. If it does, then I, then I still hope you get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I use, I, I actually use that same language because like, I, I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive and, and I've been hurt and I have hurt others and, and I don't try to, and in my addiction, it was, it was probably more intentional, but I hurt people in unintentionally. I have to make amends. I have to do things, you know, so life is messy. You know, the only way I will never hurt somebody is if I'm never in any relationship with anybody ever again, which that sounds horrible. So, so, you know, it's the give and take, but it's navigating that space. So, um, but, but I think it's interesting that we both are like, we not only survive, but we thrive. And, and I don't trade any, I mean, one of the most painful things in my more recent history was something that gave me so much more empathy for partners. Like it was such a huge betrayal and I like painful nightmares for months, you know, it was really awful. And it shifted. Like I always had compassion for partners, but I feel it on a very different level, mm. you know, having experienced that level of betrayal. So, so as awful as it was, I, I wouldn't trade even that. So, okay. Next question. My essay husband has been abstinent for four months. No recovery plan. He equates love with sex. Nope. No sex to him means he does not feel loved. My boundary is no sex unless I initiate and he has been unable to keep that boundary by trying to manipulate me to have sex or ask me when I will be ready for sex or make some subtle comments to me. So basically he's, you know, pushing. So um, to begin a sexual conversation, hoping it leads to sex because then she'll magically go, yes, I suddenly all of a sudden magically want it. So I am baffled at how to get through to him. Clearly my emotional safety takes a backseat to his addiction, need to feel loved only through sex. Ugh, I hear ya. <laughs> okay, so I don't see a specific question. However, I can speak to this. Um, I think it's, I'm baffled on how to get through to him. So I think the question is, how do I get through, how to, do him? You get through to him? Let's, let's turn it into, how do I get through to him when I've set this mm -hmm. boundary of don't push me for sex, I will initiate sex. And he's going, well, I only feel loved if I have sex, which is, okay. you know, as sex addicts always can demonstrate there's <laughs> and, sex and I'm gonna, is not I'm gonna, equate to love. So I'm going to throw this out that like, this isn't just narrowed. I mean, to sex addicts, I think um, this is a very common trait for men. And I even see it occasionally for women. So it, it's, so let's like, let's dive into this a bit. I'm, I will tell you, I'm going to start out by slicing it thinner. I'm a little nervous to answer this question because I'm worried you might hear me um, justifying something, which I'm not going to at all. Um, I'm a little bit nervous that you might hear me telling you to do things you're not comfortable with, which I'm not doing at all. Uh, but I just want to throw that out before I dive in partially because I want a model for you guys how to slice things thinner. So uh, after now that I've told you what I'm a little bit nervous about, hopefully you'll hear my intention. Um, when you talk about he equates love with sex, I'm going to start off by saying that's totally normal. Is it healthy? No. However, there is a lot of research that shows men's brains tend to be more um like sex focused first and then after sex they're actually willing to be more vulnerable um and and women's brains are emotion focused first and after they get their emotional needs met they tend to be more willing to have sex and so learning how to understand the way that we from a gender perspective tend to operate a little bit differently and i don't think it's like i said i've worked with plenty of women who have have basically said, you know, 
we can talk and be emotional or we can have sex. We're not doing both. Right. Like, cause there's very emotional men who are like, I don't want to have sex if I don't have a, an emotional connection. So don't go too gender stereotypical, but, but the reality of it is there's some of that wiring that really could be gender specific. <clears throat> now um, your boundary of no sex, unless you initiate, that's fine. Um, the, and, and, but I'm going to go to like, how long is that boundary? Like, how long is that boundary going to be there for you? Now, should you change it just randomly because you heard me talk on this webinar? No, but figure out why that boundary is there and what need you're trying to get met with that boundary. If that boundary is there because you're trying to get him to understand you, it actually probably isn't going to work <laughs> because he's now feeling resentful. He feels like you're the gatekeeper of sexual intimacy in the marriage, right? And so ask yourself, why do I have that need that I'm the one that initiates? Now, I'm sure you could give me a response and tell me lots of reasons. Sometimes we have to be careful because he might see a boundary and just think that it's you being controlling. Uh, and that's potentially not effective. So um, how do you get through to him? One, it was interesting to read, you said, uh, my emotional safety takes a back seat to his addiction and need to feel loved only through sex. One thing I might encourage you to consider is that if he's reaching to you for sex, even if he's juvenile in the way that he does it, even if he's, I'll just use this word, even though I don't love it a little, even if he's selfish, or I like the word better, um, egocentric in the way that he does it, even if he's egocentric in the way that he does it, he's still reaching to you. When somebody's acting out in their addiction, they're not vulnerable. They're not reaching to somebody else. Um, and so Potentially, if he's reaching for to you for being sexual, uh, be careful. That may not be his addiction. That may be his juvenile understanding of trying to get love and affection from you. Now, if he's acting out in his addiction, that could be a juvenile understanding, but there's no bid for connection there. And so <clears throat> how do you get through to him? You might try asking him questions. Talk to me about how... Uh, you saying uh, how you saying a dirty joke is a bid for you to connect with me and be sexual. Like, what is it about that that you think I might respond to that? Or uh, let's say he doesn't even do that. Let's say, hey, talk to me about uh, even though I've told you that I'm not comfortable with you initiating sex what's going on that you continue to do that, right? Like, help me understand what's happening in your brain, in your emotions. What emotions are you feeling when you proposition me for sex? Even though I have a boundary, right? I may not even add that in. I might be like, tell me what it's like for you to proposition me for sex. Um, is it scary? Is it vulnerable? Is it do you are you what was there did you feel like i was giving you a signal that said do this right how do you get through with him through to him might be inquire ask questions what in the world is going on in his head clearly the boundary isn't changing his mindset and if that was your goal with the boundary you're going to lose every time the boundary is never about changing his mindset the boundary is going to be about you getting a need met do you even know what the need is? Sometimes I see spouses, I see parents, I see everybody setting, this is my boundary. And I'm like, what need are you trying to get met? For them to stop? Okay, you're not, it's not a boundary then. <laughs> Boundaries are vulnerable. Boundaries are risky. Boundaries are kind of scary because I'm teaching somebody else what my need is. And if you said, well, my need is, for me to initiate and him not to, that's not a need. That's a, that's a behavior, right? Teach me 
really teach him what the need is um, and try to explore with him how that need could be met that isn't don't initiate sex. I'm not saying to let him initiate it. I'm not saying to go ahead and go through with it, but I think some work needs to be done to explore what your actual need is there because I don't think he understands what it is just by you saying no. Well, and I go back to the first line. Did that make sense? Yeah, it did, but I go back to the first line, you know, because she's like, he's abstinent, but no recovery plan. So yeah, you know what, what I, I, what I feel like there's that. no safety, yes. you know, in, in this. So yes, please do. Yeah. I didn't even address that. So the yeah. reality of it is, is if somebody's abstinent with, with, with no recovery plan, ultimately you, you most likely you have somebody who's white knuckling. So I can see where for me, why would I want to engage in sex with somebody who isn't trying to find healing right um now if they say well i am trying to find healing how by not acting out in the addiction great that's wonderful that's a really really good start in fact that's an expected start what else are you doing to try and find healing because i don't want to get back into this relationship um or get back vulnerable in this relationship without some understanding that we're progressing together. So what my need is in this scenario is to for us to find ways of personal progression, even if we're not progressing together in a sense. So my need is, look, I, I, I don't know that I can be vulnerable sexually with somebody who I don't see that with. So that does open up a bit more that I didn't even touch on. Yeah. And to me, that's the biggest thing is that, you know, I don't hear that he's working to create this, the safety for you emotionally, physically, because abstinence, just stopping the behavior is just abstinence and, uh, and the white knuckling and, and it isn't changing anything, but stopping the behavior. You know, we, we talk about you know, an alcoholic who stops drinking is a dry drunk, you know, they, right. all of the problems, all of the, and sometimes they're nastier in, you know, uh, because they don't have their maladaptive coping mechanism of going and getting drunk. So, so yeah. to me, a lot of it is, you know, I mean, it's having, and it's having the conversation of, I hear what you're saying that you want to be validated with, you know, with sex, but, you know, but we're, we're, you know, we're kind of at opposite ends right. because, Until- yeah, I'm not hearing that you're willing to do yeah. Until I know we're both going in the same direction, then I'm willing, then I might be more willing to be vulnerable with sex, right? And I totally get that. So please be patient with me as I totally jumped over that first line. Very important. Okay. So now, okay, next question. Go ahead. Do we have enough time to hit all these questions or should we save them for next? Well, time? we're going to, um, can you do one more? Let's do one more. But then, oh, but okay. then cop, uh, copy this I one will. down. I will. And let's and email it to me and I'll address it next time. Okay. My part, because this is about this weekend. So I want to, that my partner really wants to go to his annual guys camping trip this weekend. He is five weeks in recovery. He has been in an online group for seven weeks, but has missed three of them, including yesterday. He looked at, he looked me in the eyes and lied to me about something on Wednesday. He hasn't taken much initiative. I feel unsafe. Initial D-Day was 2018 when I walked in on him cheating. All Yay. multiple secret friendships, fake emails, accounts, lies, porn, et cetera, since. He feels anything he does will never be enough. Um, and that's a poor me. It's still the focus on him. I don't feel he's ever really tried to make for more than a few weeks. I want him to have a break. He says he needs this weekend, but don't want to continue to enable. I'm incredibly anxious about an overnight trip camping on a river that has tubing with lots of drinking. What can we do? That is a great question. (laughs) Um, You know, I don't have a lot of the data here. Um, I mean, there's a couple of thoughts that run through my head. Like, is there somebody on that, like, on that weekend that can hold him accountable? Or are these people he's acted out around, if that makes sense? Like, has acting out occurred on the guy's weekend before, right? Like, if, if acting out's occurred on a guy's weekend and there's been alcohol involved and this is like a recurring pattern, I'd be terrified, right? Um, 
and it, and so it's like, well, I don't know. There's a couple of thoughts. Do we have somebody who can kind of one? Would I would I say, hey, what would make me feel safe is if you told me you didn't drink. But I mean, at the same time, you're saying he lied to you on Wednesday. Like he could tell you you didn't drink and you're still worried he's going to lie anyway. Like, uh, gosh. I, I don't am know. wondering, well, like I'm going like, you, you, I mean, so he's very early in the process and he's really like not, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to retract recovery because he's not in recovery. He's maybe stopped you know, the, the acting out, but he's missed, he's not committed to recovery. I'm, I'm sorry. What well, that's, if I mean, he that's, goes, that's what I'm worried about because like, let's say for instance, there's a history of the guy's trip, but nothing ever inappropriate's happened on the guy's trip. It's just a bunch of the guys being idiots and like having a goofy time and enjoying their guy time. Then I would just be like, I don't, I don't know what the issue is here. Right. Like, but if there's like a history of, the, I mean, I know what the issue is here. The issue is fear and, and that's understandable. So I'm not trying to dismiss that, but like, if there's a history of this happening or, uh, I mean, there's a part of me that's like, for me in a situation like this, I might say, well, I guess I can trust and hope nothing happens and we'll find out on the poly <laughs> if that makes sense, but yeah. that's such a crappy position to be in. But the hard part is, is that again, as a partner, do I try and control it? Right. Do I just say, look, that's I where I was going. It. Yeah. I can't control it. If you're going to go on a guy's trip and you end up choosing to act out as terrified as I am, I have to let go. Right. There's a part of me that says, look, if you go, it, it's going to be painful because you're not doing a whole lot to create safety for me. And I'll just have to deal with that pain. Right. Like, there's so many pieces here that it's like, I totally get why you'd want to control it, but I also recognize you can't. And so, right. uh, yeah, I don't, I hope that's to me is no, I, what do you need to do to take care of you? Because here's what, here's the second vision of he's grumping around this weekend, blaming you for not oh, yeah. being on the guy's and weekend. Man, so, so, you, so yeah, yeah. So, let me so go so on like my guy's you, trip. Yeah, you know yeah. I, that would be good self care, which would help me in my recovery. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I you're in a you're in a poopy spot either way. You're gonna be the yeah. you're gonna you're the bad guy if you make him if you make him stay, and and you're gonna be in a lot of pain, fear if you let him leave. So what I would say is, man, I don't know that I would make that choice as the partner. I might tell him, here's all my fears. Here's all my concerns. Here's what I would like to see. Here's what I hope you'll choose to do. I hope you don't drink. Maybe if, if alcohol has been a, pro, a part of the addiction in the past, uh, but ultimately it's your choice. And then what I'm going to do is a ton of self-care this weekend. And I'm going to get yes. something that I yes. need. And I'm going to take care of me and I'm going to schedule mm -hmm. a girl's night or whatever. Does that make yes. sense? Like pedicure I'm spa day. On, yes. I'm going to focus on my recovery and realize that I can't control what he chooses to do. I mean, that's exactly. really what I'm yeah. going to encourage you to do. Take yeah. care of yourself, yeah. leave the choice up to him. Let him know what your fears and concerns are. That's what I would encourage you to do. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for it. I did copy the other one. I'll save it for next time. So great to see you. Thank you all. Thank you. Great questions. Thanks for sharing. Uh, you know, always, um, always so grateful to hear from all of you. So, all right. Take care. See you soon. Yeah. See you Bye. Guys soon. Bye.